this will come down, I think, in a lot of ways, at how much Kamavinga enjoys playing there. And from everything we've heard, it's not his favorite position. That's not shocking to hear. I think we all kind of knew that. But he's there's a few things here. Because you mentioned you couldn't see Fran Garcia, or, or you think Fran Garcia could have done what he had, you know, what Kamavinga did tonight. I felt like there is, and by the way, as someone to preface it by saying, heading into this season and really this this whole season, I really believe in Fran Garcia. I think you let him play through some of the mistakes. Um, offensively, he looks really promising. Furlan Mendy hasn't been in form for a while now. Having said all that, I mean, it's kind of just hard for me to argue against this because, and I said this last game, like if you look at today's game, I'm not sure if I could see Fran Garcia do what Kamavinga did today in the sense that there was just a strength to Kamavinga throwing bodies around and being so solid at the left back position. When I see that, I'm like, I'm not even sure. Like, cause Frank, cause Kamavinga was like counter pressing on that left side. He was winning the ball back really well. He was strong. The presence was known. Um, you, but we, we also kind of know why this is happening, right? To me, there's two reasons. Reason number one, and it's in no particular order, is that Ancelotti has to give minutes to Cruz, Modric, and That's the it. other midfielders he has. And two, and now Ceballos, by the way, who's getting getting playing time. Uh, and two, he's Kamavinga's probably our best left back right now. So these are just realities to me. I don't know. Like that that's why I'm kind of having difficulty arguing against this whole thing. Cause it just it does kind of make sense, you know, when you stack up all the reasons as to why he's playing there. If he was if he was just being brutal there and he was playing terrible there, then it's an obvious and much easier discussion to have. But because he's playing so well there, it's it's kind of a difficult conversation to have. Wouldn't he be able to make the, that same kind of contribution on the midfield, though? Uh, this is this is my main point here, you know. It's, wouldn't he be able to even maybe raise his level and his performances in the midfield? I feel like, again, we're kind of wasting his talents and his abilities there as, as good as and as well as he's playing right now. I can't help but feel that he's a little bit wasted there on, on that left flank because at the end of the day, we've talked about this extensively in the in the past. The central midfielder spot is way more important than than the left back one, and, and having a quality player like Kamavinga on the left flank is is a little bit of a wasted resource, in my opinion. I don't I don't know. And but to me, you 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 hit the nail in the head when you said that it, this is happening just because. Ancelotti has to find a way to play either Cross or, or Modric pretty much every single game. There's no chance, I don't think, Ancelotti would be relying on this match on 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 Kamavinga on, on, on the left side if neither Cross nor Modric were on the field. Not were on the team, sorry. No chance. No chance. So this is just the way it goes. Let me ask you this, and not to get too ahead of ourselves. <clears throat> we have our next Big game is October 28th, Classico. Do you think Ancelotti trusts either Fran Garcia or Ferlan Mendy over Kamavinga for the left back slot? I don't think so. Me I neither. think Kamavinga will get that one, yeah. I think so. Unless, too. I don't know, unless Fran Garcia. No, I don't know how many games there are left until the Classico, considering that there's a FIFA break coming. But Fran Garcia would need, I don't know, to, to have like two or three consecutive big performances for Ancelotti to trust him. And, and even then, I think it would be tough. So I don't, right now, I think it's come up as a spot there for El Clasico. Also, right keep, keeping in mind that last season, <clears throat> Tamavinga at the Camp Nou put Rafinha in his pocket at the left back position. And this year, whether it's Fermin or Yamal, who's on that wing, you know, I think Ancelotti will look at that and and I'm not sure. I think I'm I'm just not sure Ancelotti has the trust in Fran Garcia on defense. That's just the reality oh, of the situation. I, and again, just to circle back, I don't think Ancelotti is going to keep both Cross and Modric on the bench for a classical. 
So that increases come up in God's thoughts of playing on the on the left back. And that's that's basically it for me. I don't know, man. How, how that's going to be a really hard thing to do. I mean, it, it, at the at the Metropolitano, he kind of justified it by saying too many was was resting, and also Vinicius was not in the field. Uh, so that opened up a spot in some ways. They, right now, Fede Valverde is undroppable. Kamavinga is undroppable. Well, you know, he quote unquote solves that problem. He puts him at left back. Too many is undroppable. So who are you taking out if you start? He Modric? wasn't undroppable in the Madrid Derby, though. Well, uh, he is undroppable, or at least he should be. Uh, on Bellingham, because it's quite fitting to talk about him now. Obviously, the goal is brilliant. Like, there's no need to really overanalyze it and say, like, oh, he did this and that. Like, it was just brilliant. Like, he just glided through traffic, brought the ball up the field into the box and scored a brilliant goal. Uh, put that in the stat sheet along with his assists. Um, the most tackles of anyone on the field at halftime. I just thought from a defensive standpoint, forget the fact that he's on another level on the ball. He just also worked so hard defensively. Um, through different junctures of this game, uh, especially in the build-up phase, he was dropping quite deep. Vinicius and Rodrigo were kind of taking the flanks, and Bellingham was almost this false nine of sorts where he was drifting in and out of the box, but also dropping quite deep out of the box. And I just thought he was brilliant on defense as well. And that's what makes him so special. It's not just that he's doing one thing or doing things only on one end of the field. He's just so important in everything we do. And I remember going back to that last game in La Liga against Girona. He's just, he was important in that first wave of pressure that Girona were putting on us where we nearly considered two goals. He's dropping deep. He's helping escape pressure. He's kind of covering that left half space behind Kamavinga as well. He's awesome. I know you and I are completely on the same page on this as uh, Lucas. You know, we were on awe at the Metropolitano in that loss of just what he was doing on and off the ball. I mean, you, I know you have some thoughts on him too because you, you made some tweets about him, mostly like jaw agape and flabbergasted, but also bringing in uh, some stylistic parallels on some former players. What did you think? He was brilliant. He was uh, definitely the best, the best player on the field, the best player on the team also for Real Madrid so far this season. And uh, yeah, as you mentioned, he's working really hard defensively, even more even more than what he's probably asked to do in, in that uh, attacking midfielder role. He's kind of defending as a central midfielder when, when, you know, that should not and that is not probably his role. So he's been, he's been out of this world, man. You can, you can only hope that this is sustainable because if if that's if that happens real madrid have a, a bright future ahead of ahead of them with uh, with a player of this caliber I, we talked about this in the metropolitano i think he's i think he's far and away the team's best player now and didn't, so might feel this is disrespectful towards minicius i just don't think it is i just think that it's praising bellingham and and deservedly so i think he's been out of this world and on an, on an entirely different level. I'm excited to see what those two can do together over a large sample size. And I thought we saw a glimpse of that in the first half. These, this combination, it's hard to argue a better tandem one-two punch in the world. When you see Bellingham perform like this, does it make you start to think that, wow, maybe this was a Benzema replacement? I don't mean it like, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase the question, but if we're talking about like, how good are we? How good is this team? Are we going to score enough goals? When you see the fact that Bellingham already, I think he's at 11 goals and assists for the season. Does it give you optimism that like, hey, maybe like, maybe we can actually win some stuff here? Not really. Not really. I don't think... I don't think Real Madrid can rely as much on him. I think uh, that overall sustaining this kind of production on that spot would be kind of unreal. <clears throat> so uh, I think Real Madrid needs something more in the scoring department. Hopefully both Vinicius and, and Rodrigo can share the load and, and the burden in, the, in that regard and, and overall provide some more help. 
to Bellingham because and Jose Lu also who has been carrying that burden so far this season as well in in the scoring department. I think Real Madrid ultimately will need a little bit more from from both Rodrigo and and Vinicius. Obviously, Vinicius has been injured for a month, so this is no criticism uh, of him in this regard. This is more, you know, talking numbers here. Real Madrid will need a little bit more from from both Rodrigo and Vinicius to win to at least compete for the Champions League. Maybe in La Liga they will be there. We'll we'll have to wait and see. It will obviously depend a lot on how Barcelona keep performing so far this season. But in terms of the Champions League, I think uh, Real Madrid will need a little bit more from both uh, Vinicius and Rodrigo. If we're just talking purely on numbers, uh, Benzema last season, 27 goals and assists in La Liga and the Champions League. We, I think it's possible Bellingham can get there, but I want to add this following word of caution. That last season, even that wasn't enough for us to be good, Benzema's numbers. So you actually not only need to match Benzema's numbers, but you need to go far above and beyond. And that includes other players too stepping up. And defend better. And defend better. Uh, <clears throat> and at some point, like... Like I, I'm just was amazed by by Rudiger tonight. Yep. But it's one thing to like see Rudiger play that well, and it's another thing to remember that like wow, like how much is it? How difficult will it be for him to sustain it like without ever being able to be rested? You know, Alaba's injured. Nacho's going to be gone for the next three La Liga games. So then you have to think about fatigue in the future. Um, burning burnout, you have to think about all these things. And the one, the one um, thing I actually am worried about uh, now, anyway, and I hope I hope this will change, is that like even if Bellingham and Vinicius ball out for the rest of the season, I still think you need more from Rodrigo. You need Absolutely. more. You need more from a third attacker. Um, and it's great that Jose Luz played well this season, but you just need more from Rodrigo. You really do. Jose Luz has bailed. Let's make no mistake about it. Jose Luz has bailed Rodrigo <clears throat> out of some of criticism he should have probably gotten in, in weeks past with the goals he's scored. So, yeah, I definitely agree. And, and especially when we were talking about, oh, Rodrigo is not entirely comfortable on the right wing. He's more of a false nine. Let's give him a chance on either on the left or as a false nine or as a second striker. And, and you will see him thrive, all that. Then beneath his got injured, Rodrigo will be kind of the star of Real Madrid's offensive line. And so far, he has... He has not a, making a, a real statement, in, even though he's deployed in the center of the attack, which, again, should have helped him, or at least we thought uh, that way. And, uh, yeah, when, when Benitez was out for that month, he, he basically disappeared and failed to contribute in an, in an important matter. So I definitely agree. I think Rodrigo so far this season has probably been the biggest disappointment in, in Real Madrid's squad. Obviously, Real Madrid are now leading the table. They're leading the group stage. So this is not, uh, I'm not like pointing fingers at Rodrigo and saying, hey, Rodrigo is to blame for all of Real Madrid's struggles. In fact, I I actually point fingers at the defense also. But uh, to me, if we're talking about a single player, Rodrigo is quite possibly the biggest disappointment for me so far this season, which doesn't necessarily mean that he cannot bounce back, obviously. But we're just talking about his performances here. Yeah, I just so I that's I just want to circle back to Rodrigo and that point you made too. Um, of all the games this season, I thought today was the most disappointing one because he because he wasn't present at all. Um, I think to be fair to him in previous games. It was not an easy task um, <clears throat> necessarily to just, as much as we said, you know, Bellingham was kind of alone in the attack for, for large stretches of the season without Vinicius. 
obviously like you know with outliers like you know Joselu being a target here and there and and Brahim playing well in that game against Las Palmas you know it's not like Rodrigo has had this vast amount of space to work with either it's been congested so a lot of his play has been about he needs to break lines and get into good shooting positions and he's had a million shots this season the shot volume is insane from him not all of them have been from great positions um and some of that stuff like i feel like would have eventually like you know the the as cliche as it sounds the old ketchup bottle analogy like you get one or two you start gaining confidence and and the momentum swings all that stuff but today was just the most disappointing because i felt like he was just too invisible um and lucky luckily enough for us Vinicius and Bellingham were were really good on offense. <clears throat> um, yeah, and the, and the, just quick point: at the end of the day, Rodrigo has scored one goal and delivered one assist in eight hundred minutes. Yeah, that simply doesn't cut it. it doesn't yeah, cut it. and it's not just the shot volume that he's um, not scoring; he's also underperforming his xG. I mean, that's not shocking, but it's 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 a it's a significant amount, um, and that you hope that that will normalize. But it's been a problem since last season, by the way. It's not just this season. Um, Rudiger, he has a track record now of big Champions League nights against the best strikers in the world. And maybe Osimhen is not Holland. And maybe it's not the Champions League semifinals. But I even think back to like Rudiger versus Real Madrid in the 2022 Champions League where... Quite frankly and objectively speaking, he put Benzema in his pocket at the Bernabeu until Benzema popped up and scored an extra time. He has a really good track record of some of the best strikers in the world and just getting in their heads. And Osman is not an easy player to mark. He's so good in the air. There was one header that he towered over Rudiger. Apart from that, Rudiger, I mean, seven clearances on the night, four block shots. He was coming over to both half spaces to cover for the fullbacks. I thought he, he was awesome tonight. And it's just a joy to watch him on these big Champions League nights against the best strikers in the world. <laughs>